Richard, it is a pleasure to have you on, my friend. Uh, I've been waiting to do this for a really long time. Um, but if you could start from the beginning and just, you know, tell your story of how you got involved in dogs. Okay. Well, the, the pleasure's mine. Thanks for the opportunity. I basically was a, you know, I grew up around, uh, uh, you know, I, I was raised country, basically. So I grew up around, you know, livestock and dogs. We had uh, working cow dogs, you know, to work with cattle. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a big boxing fan, you know. Mm. And, uh, part, you know, part of my culture is, is game foul, you know. Yeah. And I love race horsing. I love, I love, you know, any uh, working sporting animal, you know. Uh, most most animals, regardless of where they came from or or what they were, you know, meaning meaning whether it's a dog, a horse, whatever, were domesticated and produced for a function, mm -hmm. right? Even even livestock, you know. So you know. My love for those contact sports, it just kind of led to the pit bull, you know. Horses are great. They're expensive. I couldn't afford that. Game fowl are cool, but, you know, I'm not I'm not that much into chickens, you know. Mm. And I don't remember where, but somewhere along the line, I heard about this fighting dog, you know. And like I said, I love boxing, but I can't see that good. So I learned some boxing and martial arts when I was younger. But to compete, I can't really see that well, right? So it just kind of segued and led into the American Pit Bull Terrier. I heard about this dog. And I knew that about fighting dogs, almost every culture has them mm -hmm. or had them, you know. And uh, I heard about a pit bull and I got interested in them, did all the research I could. I read all about the history, studied pedigrees before I even got one dog, you know. And... Uh, the reason I got into it was for com competition, you know, knowing all the negatives, all the, you know, whatever's involved in that aspect of it. That's why I got pit bulls was to compete with. Mm. So I started getting dogs from here and there, wherever, registered dogs, non-registered dogs out of the paper, this and that. And along the way, I started meeting, you know, real dog men listen to their stories, their blood, their, what they did with their dogs, this and that. And I started acquiring dogs from different people, you know. <laughs> I had dogs from Bobby Hall and Heinzel and uh, Bolio dogs, you know, and, and uh, just different ones, you know. And then uh, through all that, I met Steve Dunlavey and the local dog men. And it basically started, you know, you go to confirmation shows and dog men talk and all this and that and you start doing your thing with the dogs so i met dunlavey and uh, he had jeep dogs mostly he had a lot of different stuff too but he finally ended up with with the jeep dogs and uh with some red boy in it uh he crossed it to some of the white blood this and that and he had to get out of the dogs because where he kept them was his father's house his father's yard because he worked you know in construction all the time and his father passed away, and he basically had to get rid of his dogs. He couldn't keep them because he didn't have anybody that could take care of them. Mm. And that's where that's where basically my foundation came from. You know, Big Red, Miss Rowdy, Sissy, dogs like that. You know, right. and uh, I just went from there. I started competing with them. Then you know, again talking to. Older dog men, you know, one of the my influences was Ronald Boyles, you know, and he used to give me tips here and there, even though he lived it was all over the phone. He lived three thousand miles away from me, but he he would say things, you know, the the like uh, the best dogs you'll have are the ones you breed and raise yourself, you know. Mm. And if you you know if you uh, if you're gonna go outside your yard to be breed, say to a male or something, it's best to see them perform. That way, you have an eyewitness account of the quality of that animal right right so uh, that's that's kind of what got me into breeding my own dogs i consider him a great breeder and uh and i wanted to do the same and it turned out true you know i, I would tell anybody that in the past you know that the best dogs you'll have are the ones you you breed yourself because you know everything about them right. you fed them you raised them you know the parents 
you continue your breeding, you know the grandparents are all yours like that through the generations. Mm. And you feed them, you work them, you whatever, you know, bond with them. I think that's the best scenario. But that's basically how I got started, you know. I got gotcha. you. So throughout your career, who would be some of your you know, some of your 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 top fives or your top tens as far as dogs you've had or produced? Okay. Uh, well, definitely Big Red was the best producer. You could say he was the, my best dog, but, uh, you know, which was true. He, he was a type where you could breed him to almost anything and he would throw good dogs for you. You might get several in the litter. You might get one, but you're going to get something mm -hmm. that, that you can compete with or work with or breed or whatever and then sissy was a uh, inbred daughter of jeep father daughter bred off a of jeep she was a great producer i got good dogs off of her every time and uh i would say mr rowdy he was my favorite dog uh who won two with him and he lost his third in two and a half hours to champion Fox. uh bill who was my uh son's dog he was sired by big red out of another inbred jeep bitch named uh blondie pb's blondie he became champion uh k was a great little bitch he made champion uh, she was off of bill and lucy uh lucy was sired by Brock's champion ninja out of miss rowdy uh big red sister Mm. Uh, there's, there's several, you know, uh, Clayton blood. He was a two time winner in an hour 39 and two forty three. Uh, my dad's dog was a dog named Alex. Uh, I raised him, schooled him. He was sired by big red and, uh, there were, came to a point because I got busted for dog fighting for the second time. I had to get rid of all of my dogs. So I sold Alex to TVK. And uh, he beat uh, Cottingham's with an hour 20. Uh, Bambi was a sister to Kay. Uh, she was a two-time winner. Uh, I gave Johnny Hanson to uh, Vinny. He made champion out of him. Uh, the thing, too, is, you know, another example I got from other people was, you know, at that time... There were several breeders and, and people all across the country that had a lot of dogs, right? And I felt I could do better, you know, have to have better dogs, better results with lesser dogs. So I never had more than 10 or 12 grown dogs at any one time. Mm -hmm. If I had 20 dogs, it's because I had a litter or two of pups, you know. Right. But I kept the numbers down because I could control them better. They would, I could spend more time with them, you know. And uh, on a smaller scale, I could have more success. That, that was my, my thinking. And I think it worked out that way, you know. Right. It just, I always thought, you know, if you have 50 dogs or 100 dogs, how do, you, how do you raise all them dogs other than feeding them, cleaning up after them, watering them? You know, you got to deworm them and de-louse them and do all this stuff right but how much time do you actually spend with those dogs every day it makes sense that, you know what i mean so that's another reason you know my family helped me everybody was involved you know at one time i had a partner and so i didn't have a ton of dogs but i had great success with them so i was always busy i always had something to do mm -hmm. some dog to compete with sometimes more than one usually at one time out of the 10 dogs, I had five that I was competing with. So I was always busy in that respect, you know. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to be hands-on with them. If you think about it, if you have, I mean, let's say you have even uh, 20 dogs and you spend 15 minutes a day with them, just cleaning up water and all that. I mean, what's the math on that? How much? How much is that, you know? two three hours yeah something like that you know so i just uh like i said i like to be hands-on 
it's hard to put in a lot of time when you have a lot of dogs, mm -hmm. which most people didn't, you know, they do the basics and that's it. And when you have something you're going to do something with, then you put a lot of time into that dog. But we regularly exercised our dogs. Kids played with the pups and raised them. My wife helped. We were always doing something with them. We could take them here and there. You know, we even used to take our dogs to Disneyland. You know, at that time they had a kennel there. You could kennel your dogs there. Oh, that's just cool. to get them used to, you know, being in public, traveling, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it it would be hard to do all what we did if you had fifty dogs. You know, sure. There's just there's just not enough time in the day. Yeah, I'm a firm believer that. Um you can get more out of less. Yeah. Uh, because you can what, What's that term they use? Uh, quality over quantity? Kind of like that. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think you um, nailed it on the head there. I, I've always I've always said that um, even to get a program up and running, I would still, me personally, I have so much going on, I'd probably keep it maybe six dogs at most and just <laughs> focus on that. Yeah. Right. And, and, you know, in today's times, the way the, uh, you know, things are, you, you, it behooves you to have lesser dogs. It's better for you. Yeah. You, you bring, you have less attention, less problems, less, you know, they're not going to, I mean, what excuse would you have in today's times if you had 50 or a hundred dogs? Right. Unless you're, you're, uh, you know, you're a, uh, you know, noted breeder and you, you know, you, you, sell dogs to responsible people and not for illegal stuff or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. angle you're hunting them or you're, you know, uh, doing, you know, legal stuff with them, you know, right. you go to a lot of shows and, you know, you can afford to do that and enter, enter your dogs in, in, uh, legal sports, you know, the weight pool, wall climb, you know, even hog hunting or something like that. You have to have a reason for having a ton of dogs, you know? Right. And then you have to have the, the receipts or whatever they're called today to to prove why you have that many, you know, the way the laws are, you know. Yeah. And even to be a successful breeder in legal sports or whatever, you, you don't need a bunch of them. You can do it on a smaller scale, you know. Yeah. Cool. So. Absolutely. Now, what are... Now, I know uh, this this question has probably been answered on my channel a few times, but I want to get it from your perspective. What are some of the myths surrounding the American Pit Bull Terrier? Uh, you know, some of the older ones, you know, like uh, giving them hot sauce or pepper makes them mean, feeding them raw meat makes them you know, aggressive towards people and, and the gunpowder is a, used as a dewormer or to make them a man biter or pit bulls are baby killers or they're not very intelligent and uh, they're single minded, you know, they're, they're really a versatile dog, you know, mm -hmm. which is why throughout history you see them used for different purposes. Now I'm not going to deny that they were bred for the sporting aspect of it, the sporting side. That's what they were from the beginning. There's been, you know, I just did a little research thing on my group, you know, uh, showing dog fighting going back to ancient Mesopotamia and Rome and like that, you know, the UK. Mm -hmm. So the fighting dog, whatever breeds they had or whatever, has been around for thousands of years, you know. Mm. But that doesn't mean even in those days they use them for other purposes too, just like people today do. You know, one of the biggest things back in the late seventies, early eighties was using them for cat dogs, hog hunt. You know? So they're they're a versatile dog. They're intelligent. They're not stupid. They're not. For the most part, I would say over ninety percent of the time, they're not gonna bite people. Right. And, you know, I, I, I tell people this, and I'm proud of saying it. I never had one dog that ever even looked sideways at a person. Mm. Never had an incident where they showed any aggression towards humans and more so towards children. Mm. They, mine would behave differently with children because they understood that they were weak and they were little. They weren't a threat. They're not a challenge. 
So they might jump all over me, you know, excited. But a small child, they wouldn't do that because they understood they might hurt them, you know. Right. So th their intelligence covers a lot of different things, you know. And uh, I just tell people today, you know, become familiar with the breed. Understand it. Do your research. Read some history. Learn some rules for the breed, which may mean keeping them separated. Some can get along with other dogs or other breeds or other animals or whatever. Most of them can't. At least in my day, they could. Mm -hmm. If you understand that, you know, then you you relieve yourself of potential accidents can happen or accidents that did happen or do happen. Right. Uh, and and uh, there, understand which ones are able to be like that and which ones aren't. And it's always up to the dog because with a, a real pit bull, you can't force them to do anything in that respect. You can't make a dog not want to attack another dog. It's, it's the individual dog that understands the difference and that can be trained and you can redirect and and you can put that aggression or that confrontation-minded individual somewhere else. And there's a lot of them, again, throughout history that have been able to do that. But for anyone thinking you could take any pit bull and make them not want to fight or not want to attack or take that prey drive out of them through training for the most part you can't mm. most of them no uh, but there's there's some you can so those if that's what you want i would key on those that have that ability to understand the difference and can be redirected and trained not to do it right yeah i've heard of um i've heard certain stories where there was you know full-on competition dogs uh, but at home, they're surrounded by a bunch of little dogs, and they they would leave them alone. Yeah. And um, yep. that shows intelligence for sure. Now, one thing I wanted to ask you is, um, have you ever seen these dogs, while well, going back to their versatility, um, have you ever seen your lines of uh, American Pit Bull Terriers used in personal protection work? Uh, I've seen it. I don't know to what extent uh, the purity of them. And I understand that, that people nowadays, and probably it's been happening maybe a, a 20 years, you know, that they've been used for that. You know? I'm not a fan of it myself, mm. but I'm not one to tell people what to do with their dogs. Mm -hmm. And if it's the, the right person that knows how to train dogs, knows how to train dogs for that, and they can single out certain individuals, that are able to accomplish that, then, uh, then uh, you know, I could see someone with that experience being able to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. The problem is most people, not just that side of it, but other things, even use this catch dogs. They don't have the experience of the, with the pit bull and with that particular endeavor uh, to be successful without having a bunch of accidents, you know. Right. And there's some there's some stories that go along with that, right? Sure. But, you know, and, I, and this has come up recently too, you know, and I made this statement, even though I'm not a fan of it, I don't like it. It doesn't, it doesn't click right in my head, right? Mm -hmm. If somebody wanted to do that, if somebody had that experience and that knowledge and knew how to do it, then why not breed your own type of, you know, your foundation would be pit bull, your own type of pit bull used for protection work. Meaning you would use the individuals that proved successful at it. You would breed those and get more like it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this is something else that comes up, you know, does the dog's DNA, can its DNA change or can you influence the dog that would change their DNA? I believe you can Mm -hmm. So just like any breed was bred for a certain purpose, then someone should be able to breed the American Pit Bull Terrier as a as a protection dog, a family or a bloodline or a line of American Pit Bull Terriers that can do that kind of work mm -hmm. successfully and competently. 
it's just an idea that came in my head you know i can't stop it doesn't matter what i like or what i don't like mm -hmm. but if someone was responsible enough to do that why not why not breed your own you know it would be the same you know why not breed your own weight pool dogs that compete become champion grand champion all that right uh uh you should be able to do it in my mind anyways because like i said every every domesticated animal was bred for a purpose so why not that too or whatever else you want to do with them french lower course or you would have you know a line of dogs or a family of dogs or a bloodline whatever you want to call it that is particular to that function right so let me let me ask you this what are some of your favorite dogs from outside of the lines that you bred and produced? Mm, man, I've seen a ton of them, you know. Uh, I'll just kind of make a, a list off the top of my head. Dogs that I saw myself, you know, or even competed against, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Smith & Walton's champion Bad Billy. Smith & Walton's grand champion Badger, who I lost to. Uh, L.A. Dream, Dream Team's champion Jesse James, who I beat. Uh, Cat and Company's grand champion Jinx. Broach champion Ninja. P Tito and the Local Boys champion Ninja, who was a four-time winner. And I refereed his game loss to Vinny's Pete in two hours and 20 minutes. I saw grand champion Daisy May, who was a daughter of uh, Wilkerson and Powell's Little Boots. <laughs> Excuse me. I saw Ronnie Anderson's uh, champion Brutus who was the son of Hammond's uh, what's that famous dog from Gary Hammond's? Uh, Rufus. Okay. And on that same card was a uh, champion freebie and then a little a little son of a uh, champion Tonka named Buck. He was on that card too. Those were good dogs. Uh, yeah. P.L. Williams Lumpy. You know, uh, Smith and Walton's Reuben. His first litter he produced Grand Champion Badger, Champion Fox, uh, Lumpy, Taylor. You know, it was a real good litter. I saw all those dogs go. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I thought Lumpy was a real game female. She won an hour, came one of those come from behind, you know, victories. Gotcha. She got, she got butchered, man. Just, uh, just didn't quit, you know. And that's that's the heart of the American pit bull terrier that we talk about. That gameness, you know. Right. So there's been a bunch of them, you know. In Mexico, I used to go down there a lot. Champion Chamuco, just to, you know top of the line dog who had heart too you know but a devastating performer as well you know uh two-time winner named daisy and champion khaleesi champion negro and man that is you know there's so many over the years that, that you see and, and are involved with with and just have the opportunity you know i used to referee a lot too so I saw a lot of top dogs in that in that role. I saw, I saw Chinaman too. I didn't see him compete, but I saw him in schooling. You know, devastating animal. You know. Earlier, you were talking about. You know, you can't force them to do anything, and I hear a lot of fur moms and fur dads um, that really have the wrong idea about what makes an animal want to fight they think you know you're 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 forcing them to do it and you know which i've seen i've seen content you know firsthand where uh they're not forced at all <laughs> they're they want to go um can you break down a little bit of what's going on in the dog's mind just to clear it up for these people that don't quite understand right that's one of those those myths you know there is a 
an old term that says stubborn as a mule, you know. And basically what it means is when a mule doesn't want to go, he sits his butt down and you can't force him to do it. So you can't make any animal after some point do anything. Mm-hmm. If it refuses, it refuses, you know. I mean, uh, there's been examples of people beating them and putting them in certain situations and they won't do what the person wants them to do. Mm-hmm. But with the, with the pit bull, it's, it's, not a, it's not a have to, it's a want to. They do it because they want to. They've been bred to do it. The fighting instinct is in all animals, whether you're predator or prey, at different levels. Mm-hmm. You corner a rat, he's going to bite you. You know, so it's a defensive mechanism in that regard. And as a predator, it's an offensive method for them. That's how they kill prey. That's how they eat. That's how they survive. Right. But with the pit bull, it's not a survival instinct, in my opinion. It's exactly the opposite, because that part has been bred out of They don't have an instinct for survival. They don't have that instinct of self-preservation. Mm-hmm. And some people have said, you know, well, you put them in a the box, they're a confined area, they can't get out. So, of course, they're going to fight. That's not true. They can leave any time they want. Or just not fight if they don't want to. And there's tons of examples of that. Mm-hmm. So it's it's never you know the situation we put them in is is uh, is you know we we make that environment for them and that's just to keep them in an area so they can do what they want to do and they're not running all of, they're not moving all over the street or in the crowd it actually comes from boxing mm-hmm. where you know people when they had boxing matches in the past bare knuckle people would just surround the fighters right mm-hmm. and and the spectators right and they would you know and you've seen it in movies where the guy goes back into the crowd and they throw him back in and all that so that just developed into we're going to make a ring you know a, a, a area for these fighters to do their thing and and uh, then it became a rope you know and then three ropes four ropes and then it went from being a circle to a square mm-hmm. So that's the reason that we had the box and, and the pit and all that the terms that they use, you know. But it's not it's not where, you know, you you like I said, you give them that meat so they have a killer instinct. No, they, they have that instinct because it's bred into them. The, the food you give them really doesn't matter, you know, the type of food and all like that. But it's just that's that's one myth where they're forcing dogs. To, I don't know where they they got that from but it's my opinion that they they don't have the concept that these dogs would actually want to engage with each other on their own because they enjoy it or because they like it or whatever the reason because it's bred into them so they they, they it's it's a mystery to them why would these dogs want to do that right and like i said first because it's an ancient instinct whether they're defending their territory or defending their food or over mating rights and all that, whatever it is. And it's just been developed with the breed to where that's their main function. Just like a thoroughbred racehorses, their main function is to run to the left you know, and race. And they have that spirit and that intent and that mindset in them. You know, you it would be hard for someone to take a, uh, thoroughbred racehorses have been bred for that and turn them into a plow horse or turn them into a kid's animal you know those aren't the type that you would want to start off if you liked horses uh, unless you were raised with them or unless you wanted to get involved in racing it doesn't mean that's all they're good for it's not you know they use them the retired ones for uh, police work in San Francisco for example you know those those are what those horses are most of them are retired thoroughbred race horses mm. okay so you know everything has a function and that's just what the function has been developed in the american people terrier over eon i guess you know <laughs> or a millennium at least you know yeah um <clears throat> one thing i wanted to touch on was yeah and i've been talking about this recently 
in your opinion, do you think the early American pit bull and the early American bulldog had influence on each other? Well, th those are basically terms used to describe the same animal. You know, uh, in the past, the breed itself had different names, you know, mm -hmm. whether it was the pit and terrier, whether it was a bulldog, whether, you know. So when I talk about the fa past, I just call them fighting dogs, because until, at least in America, until the breed was established and given a name, uh, you know, by the UKC, it was American Staffordshire Terrier. The uh, UKC, or the AKC, was American Staffordshire Terrier. The UKC is the one he used American Pit Bull Terrier. Yeah. And then what later became known as the ADBA, same thing, American Pit Bull Terrier. Mm -hmm. So the breed with the UKC was established in 1889 or something like that, with the ADBA was 1909. And that's what it takes to give a breed a name some entity has to have standards and breeding practices all that stuff and say this is what that dog is and that's done with every every breed pretty much because even hound dogs they might call it a tree hound or they might call it a, a sight hound or whatever but when those breeds are established they each have their own different name so the dog in the past, the fighting dog in the past, most of them uh, in the United States came from England and Ireland. Mm -hmm. And when you put those two together, that's what made the American pit bull terror. And they were crossing those dogs back in the UK before they came here, right? It's not that we started that, it's just that we, I'd like to think, you know, that, that we made it the best that it can be, you know? As Americans, we have a way of doing that a lot of times. You know, we take something and we improve on it. Mm -hmm. And that's, just, that's what was done with the, with the APVT, you know. Yeah. Uh, there, there, certainly there's influences maybe from Wales or Scotland or whatever. Right. Or even, you know, Spanish breed. or whatever. There's all kinds of stories you hear where they put this dog, added this dog. Yeah. And this breed and this whatever which could be true, but ultimately the end result is going to be the same thing. You're going to use the best ones that, that prove that they're the best at what they do. And, you know, you're, they're, they're going to resemble each other. There's a range of weight generally that the pit bull is, you know, from the low 30s to maybe up to 60 pounds, you know. You don't really see, not anymore anyways, pit bulls 11, 12 pounds were in the distant past they were that small the fighting dogs were or a hundred pound pit bull you might see some anomalies like that but generally they don't get that big right yeah the reason and, i uh the reason i touched on that was because um you know when when they came over and you know the original english bulldog and those types started coming over um <laughs> i just had to imagine especially because like i look at certain lines of the American Pit Bull Terrier and some of them look more terrier and some of them look more bulldog you know the fatter head um, a little more of a square frame um, so that's a uh, that's kind of what put it in my head that like you know the the American Bulldog from back then before it was called that I mean they they definitely had to have some influence on each other especially you know considering that if you go back across the pond you know it, it, it all kind of came from the same families anyway and because the breed you know because it's bred for its function let's say you're going to have a variation of structure look style ability all these things that are involved in competition mm. and but depending on how they're bred they're going to resemble certain dogs even today some of the dogs resemble the dogs of the past you know mm -hmm. but when you breed e even with hound dogs you know there's a variation in how they look there's a variation in colors you know they're standardized by the entities but a 
again, when you do that, now you're breeding for the way the dog looks and how it's built, not for what it does. Right. And the, the pit bull was not bred for how it looks, it was bred for what it does. And within that, you're going to have some variation. But you can pretty much trace, you know, where the where the influence of your dogs come from. You know, whether it's the terrier side or whether it's the bulldog side or whether it's a mix of both. And that's what people did, a mix of both. Some of the crosses, the old crosses that are mentioned, like, uh, you know, Tudor, Colby, you know. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a cross of English and Irish dogs. You have Colby Leitner. You know, you have uh, even Carver Eli or Red Boy G or whatever. You know, it, it's basically people doing the same thing that was done in the past, just the names change mm-hmm. and the breeders change, you know. But the American Pit Bull Terrier is mostly an English-Irish cross. How would you compare the temperament between male and female? Well, with mine, it wasn't too different except, you know, in the breeding aspect, you know. I wanted females that were good mothers. I wanted females that took care of their pup uh, when they were in that state of mind. That's what I wanted. I didn't like females that didn't care for their pups or killed their pups. I never had anything like that, but if I did, I would not keep it in my breeding program. Mm -hmm. But my dogs were so high strung that I eventually started using AI, learned how to do it myself because it was easier. You know, the males and females would fight each other. Gotcha. So it was, it was just easier for me to do. It takes less time. Yeah. And, uh, it worked for me but as far as temperament goes you know a female except in that endeavor i wanted a female to act like a female a lady have those qualities you know and a male to be like a uh you know not not maybe dominant but have macho traits you know Mm -hmm. uh it's kind of hard to to explain sometimes but Whatever you think are male traits, that's what I wanted to see in my dogs. Yeah, yeah masculinity. It could be, it could, it, yeah, it could be. But they share a lot of stuff, you know. I like prey drive. I like uh, that finishing instinct, you know, in both. But I was real particular about my females when it came to the brood pen, you know. Yeah. I, w- I wouldn't tolerate a lot of stuff, just like I wouldn't tolerate dogs that bite people. And I had dogs like that. That's what, that's where I learned how to avoid getting bit and to recognize the signs of a man biter or a man eater so I could protect myself against them and, and recognize which ones were like that. And then eventually I didn't tolerate any of that. I never would have one again, you know. Gotcha. It's not, it, uh, I don't care how good a dog is because in my mind, I could have all those traits without having the man biting aspect and still get good dog. So it wasn't necessary. Sure. It wasn't, it wasn't something that I could, that I had to put up with. No, I could make as good or better dogs without having that negative trait in there. For me, it was simple, you know? Gotcha. Well, this is kind of random, but, uh, what are your thoughts on the, uh, Patterdale Terrier? I like them. You know, I have a buddy, he's on, he's online, uh, Joseph Carter, the mink man, you know, mm. and he uses, he uses different breeds, you know, they, they hire him to clear out rats in barns, and different people, and he hunts raccoons with them, and Nutra, and all kinds of stuff. So he incorporates different breeds of dogs, the little terriers, you know, Patterdales, and rat terriers, or whatever you want to call them, and he has a lurcher, he's got pit bulls different things but i think those dogs are just the terrier being the way it is they're so tenacious and so strong-willed and have been bred so long to go to ground and get in there face to face with a an animal that 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 uh is attacking them as much as they're attacking it and then come out on top they hunt and kill the animal i just think you know terriers have a lot of spirit you know 
and they have a lot of uh, of uh, you know vitality and, and a lot of the traits that we that we admire you know I like them I kind of like all dogs you know I, I grew up different breeds you know we had those cow dogs like I mentioned we had German Shepherds we had mutts you know, hound dog here and there you know mm -hmm. because I just I, we like dogs you know? Now, is there any other breed outside of the American Pit Bull Terrier that you're heavily interested in? Well, other than, you know, once I got the American Pit Bull Terrier, I, I didn't concern myself with other breeds, even though I could admire them. Right. You know, uh, understand and accept what they did, you know. Uh, the cow dogs would be... Uh, my next favorite because that's what we had and we used them for working cattle, you know. Sure. They're very intelligent. They have a lot of spirit. They have a lot of heart for what they do, you know. Those cows will kick them. They'll step on them. Mm -hmm. Knock their teeth out, break their ribs, you know, and the dog, in that respect, like a pit bull, it just won't get up. It, it'll go back to doing its work, you know. They sustain an injury, they're ready to go the next day, you okay. know. And uh, uh, not that we would do that, but they wanted to work. With my dad would just put them up you know, to the heels. But I just like working uh, dogs. Uh, you know, I admire catch dogs. I've, I've been on several hog hunts. You know, I'm not a hog hunter. I'm not a hunter of any type. But I'm a helper when I'm with them guys. But just to see them work. Mm -hmm. And some were pure pit bulls. Some were pit bull and staff mix. Some were catch dogs that were developed using more than two or three different breeds to produce a catch dog. The best one I seen, the best catch dog I ever seen was an 80 pound dog, which was big enough to handle a 400 pound pig by himself. He was strong enough. He was smart enough. He could finesse them. You know, it's not all, you know, I'm going to overrun you or I'm going to dominate you. Sometimes it takes intelligence to have to move. And he was like that, you know. He had Pitbull, he had Great Dane, he had some other stuff in him. He had a hula, different things, you know. Mm, okay. So basically anything that likes to work, I like it, you know. <laughs> or sporting, whatever. That's what I like. I just like doing something. And that comes from my father because he grew up poor. So any animal they had had to provide a service or, or produce some kind of function had to be used for something whether it was protecting the family whether it was used with cattle whether it was uh you know livestock for food or whatever he didn't have pets growing up you know but he understood that he could use these animals for different things and they could provide a service gotcha now for the people listening they're very uh, very hungry for breeding knowledge. So I wanted to ask you, how close are you willing to breed and why? Break down a little bit of inbreeding, line breeding, and outcrossing in, in your experience. Okay. Well, at first, I prefer line breeding because it allows you to continue forward and you still retain a lot of the uh, ability and and function and, you know, air, whatever you want to call it, mouth and and balance and all these things within that's involved with a, a sporting dog. Inbreeding has its place, but I advise people not to go too heavy with it because you'll start losing traits. And people like to use the word purity and sometimes they go too far with it. They think pure means good only and it doesn't. So if you go too heavy with it, all the negative stuff that's in there is going to start coming out. Because everything that's in the breed itself, or everything that comes out when you make breedings, it's in there already. It isn't like something just pops up out of nowhere. It's in there. You just awakened it again, or, or it's come out. And, and the fastest way to do that is through inbreeding to produce the negative results. So I advise people, if you want to inbreed, make your inbreeding. And if you get the results you want, move forward with that. Either line breed it after that or outcross it. 
so with line breeding which to me is family breeding the dogs are related but not tight uncle niece you know cousins aunt nephew like that okay. inbreeding is immediate family father to daughter mother to son brother to sister like that outcrossing itself should produce superior athletes could produce hybrid vigor could produce ability you know an improvement of what you started of, of the two individuals you bred together in my opinion if you make an outcrossing you don't have superior athletes from it the breeding didn't work now other people have other opinions and they have other ways of using those outcrosses and what outcross does is once you make that breeding when you introduce a different blood or something new the resultant pups from that breeding allows you to go back to your stuff your family of dogs and you have that outcross in it where uh, it's not too tight okay and people ask me all the time you know when do you make an outcross when how many generations there's for me there's no there's no set standard of how to do that so basically if i saw something that was outside my yard it wasn't related or maybe had some similar blood but not directly related to my dogs i would make the breeding if i liked the dog i didn't wait till i lost something i didn't wait till uh you know i was missing something or something like that i just basically if i liked it now you can do it that way too if you're lacking something and you need uh some fresh blood or you need some traits that's dominant in this other dog that's not related to your dog then make your outcrops you can do that too gotcha and for me whenever i bred something different or outside my yard or whatever i got better results if i bred to an individual that had the similar traits that my dogs had mm -hmm. which you have a better chance of getting those traits even though they're not related they both retain the same traits you have a better chance of getting those traits that way but another thing is you know you have dogs with certain traits and these dogs have different traits and you put them together and you hopefully get the best of both mm -hmm. like a, a bully son Bolio or Mendocino crops, right? They're two different styles, basically, even though they have some similarities, two different mindsets, two different uh, structures, you know? Mm. You put them together and you get the best of both. Right. That's okay. another example of outcross. But I just had better results even with the outcross. If dogs res uh, retain the same traits, I got a better chance of getting those traits because they both have it. Gotcha. Now I had a random question. This is more just something I was wondering. Um, I noticed a lot of people in the American Pit Bull Terrier world would breed for ability, breed for, you know, this one is very hard mouth, this one's very game, and so on. Now I see there's certain dogs out there with just these massive long hangers they're canine is right is that something that is bred on purpose or just does that does that just pop up here and there well you know there's there's uh it's it's you know that's kind of hard to answer in that way it's something that's in the breed right for example some of the heinzel dogs i saw back then had big ass teeth the white dogs were known to have big teeth. Some of the Carver dogs had big teeth. Eli dogs, big teeth. And just like anything else, yeah, it's something you can breed for. Mm -hmm. Now, how effective those teeth are is dependent on the individual itself. You know, big teeth doesn't mean hard bite, but if they're big, strong teeth, it's just a tool that that uh, you know you're. It, if you don't break them and they're solid and like that, you know, it's, it's just right. a tool that'll help you get the job done. Right. But that doesn't mean dogs that don't have big teeth can't be hard biters or, or dogs that have, you know, not very sharp teeth can do a lot of damage because there's a way to, there's different ways that 
damage can be done. It could be crushing, it could be punctures, it could be slicing, it could be a lot of different things, depending on where a dog hits the other dog. It's that some some areas are softer, some areas are easier to do damage to, some are harder, some, you know, gotcha. all dependent on the dog. So it's something that, that you know, uh, you can breed for if, if uh, they're effective in using it, you know, it helps you know yeah it's like uh one one man with a screwdriver can be better than the other man with a drill exactly something like that you know and it's all it's all you know people which can happen too they have big long teeth they're easier to break mm -hmm. that, that's not a that's not a tooth problem that's a health problem right you know that that's that's a uh yeah, and it's could be in his DNA that. or could be what they ate or how you know poor health yeah poor immune system poor you know not not dur not durable less constitution different things you know right. and, and I'll give an example this way in some of my dogs they could be destructive fight their bulls fight their chain fight their house you know of course they chip teeth right or break them because it's it's ivory on metal or ivory on wood, whatever it is, mm. or you know, stainless steel pan. But with my dogs that weren't that way, I never had a chip tooth really. Not not even an incisor broken. Right. And and a lot of that I think is how they were how they were fed from a pup, you know, where they had good good bone, good teeth, very hard to break. And uh, that's just part of the health, you know. And uh, uh, I always, we always gave our pups goat milk mixed in with their food, you know. Uh, okay. A lot of calcium. I, I don't advise cow's milk because it can it can hurt their pancreas, you know. Right. So I wouldn't advise giving cow's milk to dogs, but goat's milk is is the alternative, and it makes their bones and their teeth strong. Okay. Um. So, with that being said, what did your feeding regimen usually look like? I used, uh, it's not available anymore, available anymore. The kibble I used was called Neutral Max Stress. It was high protein, high fat. And then I used a vitamin mineral supplement. And, uh, the supplements I gave, and th this I gave in the daily feed, but in small amounts, not the recommended doses because the food... Uh, I gave, you know, had, had the same stuff in it. So I didn't, I didn't even in keep, I didn't give the recommended amount because I gave, uh, I used kibble and I used regular food, you know, meat, other things. But in their daily feed was that kibble, a vitamin mineral supplement, the trace elements in it, B15 and desiccated liver. And, uh, you know, uh, some people might say that's a lot of stuff to give them, which is true. But you know, if you regularly exercise your dogs, then it'll have a good effect. If you go too heavy on something, say protein or vitamins, you know, minerals like that, they can develop hot spots on their skin, like patches, you know, where they lose hair. But I didn't have that problem because I all always regularly exercise the dogs, whether it was on the chain, you know, maybe pull them on the chain or hand walk them or take them out and run them in the fields, you know. There was an empty field near our house filled with with squirrels. So I could take a dog there on a long lead, 25 foot or 50 foot lead, and just let them dig for an hour or two, you know, after the squirrels. Mm. So that was their basic feed. That was their daily feed. And then Sometimes, you know, they catch a squirrel or a rabbit or a gopher or whatever, and they'd eat that. A possum, you know. Sometimes uh, we give them scrap meat or scrap vegetables, you know. Sometimes mm -hmm. cooked, sometimes raw. So they had, you know, their diet was pretty much the same all the time. But in doing that, I never had any, any uh, stomach problems or digestive problems. They could eat anything. My dogs would eat anything. Kids could give them salt or chips or salad or so. They'd eat it, man. They didn't. They were just that way, you know. Gotcha. 
Uh, I, di I didn't have any allergy problems or really any, any internal organ problems. You know, you're always going to have something come up. You're going to have parvo. You're going to have coronavirus. Now they have Babesia and there's coccidia and all that stuff. You can practice preventative maintenance to avoid as much of that as you can, you know, worms and all that, you know. Mm -hmm. So we had a regimen where we, you know, uh, once a week we sprayed bleach in their area, changed their bedding out, you know, uh, every so often, deworm them every so often, you know. Uh, I use seven dust on them, you know, on the dog and in their house. Spray the yard, you know, keep the lawn cut down short. Don't have any standing water, you know, there's fleas and ticks and all that stuff coming around. So there's a lot to it. Mm. And uh, the, the feed itself, you know, I tried to give them the same type of feed all the time. I didn't change the feed. You see people changing, you know, I'm going to try this kibble. I'm going to try that. I'm going to try cooked. I'm going to try raw. I'm going to this and that. If you keep it pretty much regular, the same type of feed, you know, you'll have less digestive problems or stool problems or urine problems, you know. Right. And you can give them a variety of stuff, you know, but they just have to be become accustomed to it. And it's part of their diet. And, you know, you, you might get them used to eating. Well, I give them chicken one day and beef the other day. I add fish, this type of vegetable, this and that. As long as you make that consistent, you, you won't have a problem with your the food, you know, your dog reacting to certain foods. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you have a litter of pups, what are some of the things you would do to test the pups? Here's how, here's basically how we did it. If the weather was good, I had an area outside away from the other dogs and a whelping area, you know. And uh, if it was cold, we always brought the female inside and she would whelp inside the house. My wife made an area under the pa in the pantry underneath. That was their whelping box, you know. Mm. And uh, basically her, you know, because I worked or whatever, her and the kids raised the pups, right? And with all our females, we got them to having, to being accustomed to having us around all the time somebody's there all the time mm -hmm. so during well when they're having the pups we could be there and help kids had to be quiet they understood that and she could help deliver if she needed to or just be there support maybe give them a little water pet them whatever you do because a lot of females will act funny you know when they're having pups they could become aggressive we never had that problem because that's the way we raised our dogs they were all involved, all inclusive family. Right. right. And then it's just a matter of, of uh, spending time with those pups. And I get feedback from the kids, you know, and the wife and all that. But you have to be out there and you have to spend time with them and look at them. And basically what I look for is, and this is after, you know, breeding my own dogs for more than a few generations, is I look for pups that acted like their ancestor did at that age. That gave me an indication that the traits are being passed on. Those pups are retraining the traits, the traits of their ancestors, parents, grandparents, great grandparents. And then it's just a matter of uh, which litters have the higher percentage of good dogs in them. Those are the ones I'm going to follow in the breeding program. The lower percentage litters or dogs that maybe I competed with, but they had some flaw that I didn't like, a major flaw, what I would consider, like thin bone or, uh, you know, not, not durable, you know, have a low tolerance for pain or whatever. Those weren't the ones that I would include in my breeding program. Mm -hmm. But that's basically what I look for in the pups, you know. Uh, we just kind of had a little debate, you know, the pick of the litter. How do you know a pup, you know, that's the best one and all that? Well, if you know your family of dogs and, uh, you know, you own the parents, you own the grandparents, you saw all the litter mates, you own the litter mates or saw them or had them or whatever, then your family is going to exhibit certain traits. They're going to retain certain things about them because they're related, sometimes close, sometimes not so close. 
but they're all going to have particular traits in them that you're looking for to retain and keep and hopefully pass on in your breeding program. And that's how I looked at the pups. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we had several picks of litters. You know, we, I could. My son generally made the picks, you know, but I agreed with him most of the time. That's that's the best one, right? Mm-hmm. And ninety percent of the time, we were right. And but the only way to do that is you have to know the history or the ancestry of your dog. Mm-hmm. You can't just breed two dogs together and go, oh, that's the bully, he's the pick, or you know, he's the serious one, or whatever. That's the pick. No, they, they the, the that's part of their temper, and and you have to that has to be consistent. So what I mean by part of their temperament, my dogs were very vocal, most of them in the corner, right? That's part of their trait. Mm-hmm. Any deviation from that would make me would make me question the dog. How come he isn't an early starter? How come that one isn't, you know, vocal? Mm-hmm. That's part of their family. That's part of their genetic makeup. So I would question the one that isn't like that. And most of the time we were right. It's never 100%. Nothing's ever 100%. You could be wrong, which is why even though I had my picks or I had my favorites, with my family of dogs, most of the time I kept all the litter, or the whole litter, just in case I was wrong. Maybe I picked the wrong one. But generally we weren't wrong because, like I said, they were just exhibiting the traits of their ancestry right. uh, at that age, whether it's eight weeks, six months, a year, whatever it is. You have to have that consistency in temperament to, you know, uh, make and have a family of dogs. Even through outcrosses, you know, the outcross doesn't have to totally change your dog or, or you go off on a different tangent or start a different program or something like that. Because like I said, if the outcross I'm using has similar traits that my dogs do, then that's what I expect to see in the resultant offspring. Mm-hmm. Same stuff. Right off jump, I imagine this, I'm no expert, but I imagine you'd be looking for the one who's fucking up everybody else, right? That- uh, I would say if that's the traits of your family, yep, that's what I'd look. If, if yours, the, the better ones exhibit more mellow type, you know, mm-hmm. then that's what I'd be looking at. If it's a more serious type, quiet type of dog, then that's what I'd be looking at. So with mine, yeah. If you want to call him a bully or you want to call him the dominant one or the mm-hmm. one that has a lot of spirit and doesn't, you know, always looking for trouble. Yeah, with my blood, that's what I look for. Early starters. Yep. They have to be separated young. Right. Yeah. And that's where people kind of get it mis- mixed up. They'll say, well, the rump could turn out to be the best one. OK, that's true. The, the one who doesn't engage, more quiet, off by itself, that could be the best one. That's true. Uh, the one that's the more serious type doesn't doesn't play with his litter mates off by himself, but, you know, stern and serious and, and doesn't uh, require bonding and stuff like that. That's true. And what I'm saying is if that's <laughs> those are the traits of your family of dogs, then, yes, you would follow those. Mm. But but uh, with mine, it was more the aggressive type, the high spirited, looking for trouble, want to engage all the time. Right. And like I said, 90 90 percent of the time, that's how it was, because that's the traits of the family. That's the consistency that I was looking for. Mm. <laughs> so you have to know what you got. You have to know what to expect. And then you have to see it in the pups and as they're growing and as they become adult, because it doesn't turn out 100% that way. <laughs> Sometimes that one you think, <laughs> excuse me, it's all right. is going to be the best one. It's not, but that should be on the low end of the scale. You should be wrong every five or six or seven litters, not every breeding, not, not uh, <laughs> right. most of the time. You should be right most of the time. Because you should know your dogs. Uh, I get a lot of, you know, uh, criticism for that. Uh, how you going to tell? It's a pup. Well, 
like I said, you should know your family of dogs. How did how did Ronald Boyles, when his pups were born, he could tell me what pit weight they were going to be when they were grown. He could tell me what their style is going to be like. He could tell me and his dogs which ones were the best ones. So if he can do it, why can't somebody else do it? Why can't I do it? Right. That's not to, not to insult anybody, but what I'm saying is, yeah, you can do that. It's not rocket science. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, a lot of work. There's no fast track to it. Some science, some, <laughs> you know, nutrition, all this stuff, animal husbandry and, and understanding canines in particular, all this stuff can help you. But I always felt, man, if that guy can do it, I can do it. And, and maybe I can do better than him, you know. Right. Maybe I can condition better than that guy who I considered a great conditioner. How do I become better than that person? Right. As <laughs> trial and error and practice and some knowledge and experience. So with that said, <laughs> you've seen late starters or you've seen the the the, the quiet kind of just in the back of the litter minding his business. You've seen that dog turn out just later on. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. For example, Brat's champion ninja. I had him in my yard for several months. We were the first ones to breed to him. And that came about because, uh, uh, Vinny had, uh, won with him his, uh, second and third match. Right. So he was out here in California and I'm talking to, Don Bro, and I said, man, I saw him go, you know. Well, he was there, but Don Bro, was, we're talking about it. He was there, came out to California, saw his win, third win. And I said, man, I'd like to breed to him. He said, Richard, he won't breed, man. Tried to breed to him, he won't breed. I said, Don, you know I do artificial insemination. I'll get him bred. He said, well, go pick him up. So I did, we got him. And uh, we did two breedings with him. And he was that type, serious, serious type. And I don't mean serious that he would bite you or aggressive that way, but <laughs> excuse me. Yeah. He didn't care. He didn't care if you pet him or not. You know, mm -hmm. he would let you pet him, but he wasn't like whacking his tail and happy. He, he wasn't the type that you bond with and then have that kind of relationship. He was just a serious dog mm -hmm. and quiet. You know, he wasn't didn't make trouble on the chain, didn't bark and all that stuff. That way. I had another one, Clayton Blood. When it was time to go, he acted just like my dog did, screaming, hollering, a lot of intensity like that. But on the chain, he was mellow. He would lay down. The other dogs could be barking and jumping around. He didn't care. He just kind of mellow out, kick back, you know. Uh, he was just intelligent enough to know that, why am I going to be hollering, screaming, making all this noise when I'm not doing nothing? Right. There's a time and a, <laughs> there's a, time and a place for that, and this ain't it. That's kind of how I felt about him, you know. Right. Or the little runt, you know, he could turn out to be the best one. So, uh, all this stuff that people say is true. But what I tell people is, you know, you got to have consistency in your dogs. You got to know as much as you can about them. And that comes with spending a lot of time raising them and working them, exercising them, you know. See where their intelligence factor is, you know. Can can they be taught different stuff? For example, my daughter taught a couple of our dogs to climb trees and chase after squirrels, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with every dog. But just different things like that, you know. And what I did with my dogs from a very young age is I taught them my key. I raised them all the same with the idea if it worked, if its dog works out and I can use them in competition... He already knows how to do my key. He already knows how to work. So I don't have to teach him anything. They were raised that way. If they didn't turn out, then no harm, no loss. The dog got some exercise. He's not included in my breeding program. And that's okay, too. That happens. They don't all work out. Mm -hmm. So because what I noticed back then at that time, most people, dogmen, competitors, breeders, whatever, whoever they were, they didn't do much with their dogs. They were basically on their chain or in their kennel most of their life. And when they put a weight out and wanted to compete with the dog and put them in keep, that's the first time they exercise their dog in their whole life. The dog could be two or three years old. 
never did shit or much of anything. Mm -hmm. Very little, if anything. Right. And I just thought, man, that, that never made sense to me, you know. I mean, when your kid plays sports, you start him and Pop Warner, you know, and then he goes to high school and he's playing football in college and beyond if he's good enough, right? Right. Boxing, same thing. You start kids eight, nine, ten years old and they learn amateur boxing with the headgear, all that stuff, and as they progress, you know. So why wouldn't you do that with your dogs? That's what we did with our cow dogs, you know. We put the young ones out with the older ones and they'd learn how to work them cattle. And they'd learn the commands of from my father. And the dogs we had, those cow dogs, they were bilingual, so he could give them commands in Spanish or English. And oh, they understood cool. what he was saying. So that's kind of what how I raised my pit bulls. But why would I wait till they're an adult and then show them how to work a treadmill? That don't make no sense to me. Right. They should work. They should, they should know how to use a treadmill when they're eight weeks old. Put them on there for a minute, three times a week. That's all it takes. Let them get used to it. They're not, you know. You've heard stories, and you've probably seen some dogs. You put them on a treadmill, and they're scared to death of it. Why? Mm. They're not familiar with it. They don't like the noise. They, it's off the ground. Whatever it is. So if you teach them when they're little, they, you don't have a problem. And you can do that with anything. And I, I've said this even recently. You know, if you can teach circus dogs or whatever to jump through hoops of fire and to ride a bike and walk a, a you know the tightrope and all that why can't you teach a pit bull to do whatever kind of work you tell them to do whether it's flirt pole spring pole cat mail treadmill swim chase a ball whatever tug of war mm. and for me it's just a matter of doing it from when they're young you know some are gonna like things other than some things better than other things, mm -hmm. but they can become pretty proficient with, with anything you want to teach them. If you can just get in their head and, and uh, make them understand that this kind of work pleases you. And dogs like doing work. Most, most of them do. You know, you have some that are lazy. I don't like those types. I've used them. I wouldn't have them. I wouldn't keep them. My dogs were eager to work, you know, and, and all this sounds, you know, positive and I know this and that, but it comes through trial and error. You know, I've used dogs that weren't very good workers. That's not my type of dog, you know. I wouldn't breed a dog like that. Right. I wouldn't keep a dog that's, I wouldn't breed a dog that's real timid. Mm -hmm. A little bit shy is okay. I can bring them out of it, you know, especially if they're younger. But timid, like scared of their own shadow, you know, so introverted that they're spooked when you walk up to them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep or breed a dog like that and a lot of that comes because of how they were raised sit on their chain their whole life out in the middle of nowhere never see nobody never see nothing never go nowhere mm -hmm. and then they become an adult and now you have more than one problem with this dog what do you do with it you know that, that's the person's fault it's not the dog's fault sure that's sometimes right. sometimes you could break them of it sometimes you can't if it was an adult it was like that with me, you know, I, I just couldn't break them of it. They just stayed that way. It's usually a dog I got from someone else. It wasn't one of mine, but I had a few that I got from other people where they just scared of their own shadow, and I never could break them of it. If it's a pup, I never had a problem with it because I just give them to the kids. Here, this pup scared, go play with it. Right. And, uh, you know, one pup, one pup we got from someone else, he would crawl on his belly. He wouldn't even walk on a lead, you know. Oh, man, in six months, in six months, he was a house dog. He could ride in the truck and he'd play with the kids and run in the chase balls and all that stuff, you know. But he was just so isolated when he was a pup in the dark most of the time, didn't get much sunlight. He was just so timid, so, you know, introverted that, but we caught him young, you know. He was only maybe three months old when we got him. Mm. And Angie and the kids just brought him out of that shell. Man, he was good. Going back to feeding, do you feed and supplement, or did you feed and supplement pregnant and whelping females differently? Uh, with the females, the the with the pups, like I said, you know, we we was standard to give them goat's milk. You know, mm -hmm. with the females, I either gave them beef, you know, or liver just for the higher iron content, you know, that seemed to help. Mm -hmm. But other than that, with the female, we just gave them more food, 
and added beef and, and liver. With the pups, they ate the same food as the adults ate, but with those same vitamin, mineral, B15, all that, supplements, and goat's milk. Pretty simple, you know. And then throughout the most of the dogs, all of them, throughout their life, I gave them uh, beef bones, big knuckle bones, you know, raw. Yeah. Uh, just things like that. Sometimes they catch a chicken, you know, and they just eat it. I just let them eat it, you know. They caught a gopher or something running by, or if they're out in the field and they grab it, I let them eat it, you know. They caught it, they eat it. And uh, right. I, that happened several times, most with every dog. They caught a possum or they dug a squirrel out or something like that. That was basically their raw feed, you know. Mm. So uh, a lot of people don't like that, you know. Oh, they might get rabies or they got worms with it. That's all right. I'll take care. They ain't got no rabies, you know. Mm. That's, that's very rare. Uh, in fact, I was working a dog one time and my cousin was with me and we're walking it out to empty it out. And the dog stopped. We were in tall grass and the dog stopped, looked in the grass reached down and pulled the gopher out of the ground and swallowed it, you know. <laughs> and my cousin goes, hey, take, take, stop him, stop him from eating it, you know, could have rabies, this and that. I said, the hell with that, he caught it, he can eat it, you know. Right. He's a gopher, <laughs> yeah. you know. So, uh, you know, for me, in my mind, you know, that kind of variety is okay, you know. If my dog caught a loose chicken or a loose bird or, or something flying around, you know, near their house, standing on their house and they sneak up and eat it, I let them have it, you know. Right. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, like I said, we live out in the country, so there's rabbits run by and squirrels sometimes, you know. They, they, they come up, they want to eat the dog's food at night or something, middle of the night. You know? Or the chicken comes up, pecking here and there, you know, the neighbor's chicken or ours or whatever, you know, gets loose, gets near the dog's area, so they, they're quiet, they'll wait. You know, I'll come out in the middle of the night and there's some feathers on the ground. And, and the dog's belly is bloated, you know. <laughs> well, must have got a chicken. Yeah. Ate the whole thing, you know, feathers and all. So, so you know, that's just part of living out there and doing that, you know. Now, I've always heard, like, when it comes to the raw diet, um, for people that feed raw, you know, if they were to field dress an animal, they always, you know, make sure they take out the, the gut first. Or whatever. Do do you think a dog naturally, you know, when he's eating an animal, will just avoid that, or can he digest that? Well, like I said, the the you know the smaller prey like that, you know, it, sometimes my dogs would, would kill coyotes, you know, mm. and those we didn't usually let them eat. It takes too long, you know. Mm. But but with mine, like I said, whatever they ate, they ate it whole, you know. I mm. never really had one. Where it would kill a larger animal and let it just sit there and chomp down. But when dogs do go to that belly area and that, you know, internal organs, you know, that's part of their instinct living in the wild, being a predator. They understand those are where uh, different nutrients are, you know. Mm -hmm. There's carbs there, there's grains, there's a lot of vitamins and minerals in that area. So it, it would be a matter of doing that and seeing what the dog does, you know. Right. Uh, a lot of that awful, you know, heart, liver, kidneys, intestines, you know, it's good for them. Good. And the dogs, you know, they'll eat it. They understand either that it's food or they have some instinct for the nutrition involved or whatever it is. Uh, they'll eat, you know, they'll eat the bones, they'll chew on the bones, they'll eat the feet and hooves of cattle and pig snout, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give somebody new who wants to get involved in the American Pit Bull Terrier? Well, the, the basic advice I give is learn as much as you can about the dog. Read about the history, learn to read pedigrees, learn the nature of the breed, learn the different bloodlines. Before you ever get one dog, learn the behavior and temperament generally of the breed itself, you know? Mm. Because if people would do that first before they ever acquire one dog, they might realize that this is not the dog for me. Mm. There's an infatuation with the breed. 
and there's you know it's a tough dog and you know it's american pit bull terrier and he's a fighter and all this stuff and which i'm not saying that none of that that that's not true but for your particular situation you know these are these are high spirited high ability high intense you know very intelligent prey driven instinctive animals and it may not be the type of pet you want in your home you know mm. so that that's the advice i give you know when, when people ask me that learn as much as you can about it before you get it and then you have to decide what bloodline you like and what matters most is who has the dogs and what they did with them as far as the breeder goes you know what bloodline does he have how does he raise his dogs what does he have them for i mean i know a lot of different breeders nowadays they breed them for hunting you know they're good for coyote hunting they're good for catch dogs they, you know they're they're finding different functions for the breed where they can be useful and and uh, do something with them and uh it's they're not going to get in trouble for it, you know mm -hmm. but if you just want a pet you know sometimes a pit bull ain't ain't for you you know right the the dogs need exercise they need uh you know to be focused on something they're a working dog or a sporting animal you know mm -hmm. so you have to take that in consideration if you hike a lot or you go out to, you know, to the ocean, go up in the mountains or, you know, you have a, a, a set up in your yard, you know, where uh, the dog can do some kind of work and, and release that energy, you know, that's great. But to have them just sitting around doing nothing and, you know, that's where they can become destructive. They'll chew your house up and the couch, you know, and they'll tear things down and they'll break your window they do all kinds of stuff because they have a lot of energy you have to release it you have to redirect it to something mm -hmm. so they they require a lot of attention and they require exercise okay. <clears throat> so where can people where can people find you uh they can contact me on facebook messenger mm -hmm. or my email Richard J sixty Richard J Schoolboy sixty at gmail dot com and then I'm on Instagram also. Okay, and on uh, Instagram it's just you know, I, Yeah, you know I have a I have a, a a YouTube channel too. I post all kinds of videos up there. I have interviews and different videos, different aspects of the dog's conditioning, you know, feeding. Uh, breeding techniques, you know, talking about history and all kinds of stuff. So I have that. And then I've written three books. I sell my keep. Uh, I have t-shirts, breaking sticks, hats, and uh, reprints of old sporting dog journals. You know, oh, people right. generally, uh, they can buy directly from me if you're interested in that kind of stuff. But they can hit me up those three avenues. I, I, I will respond. You know, I, I kind of make it a, it's a thing with me. If somebody sends me a text or a message or a Instagram, I have to answer them. I answer all the comments on my videos. I'm just anal that way, you know, it's just, uh, that's part of my upbringing. You know, it's kind of like somebody gives you something, you should say thank you, you know. Mm -hmm. If we didn't say thank you, my mom would pinch us or she'd go, hey, say thank you, you know, mm -hmm. like that. So. That's just part of the way I am. I'm going to answer. It may be a day late or a week late, but I will answer you, even if it's a thank you or a yes or a no. <laughs> <laughs>